Lights on the screen in front, please. Technical crew, thank you. Okay. Okay. Give a big warm applause to their person. Thank you. Okay. So sorry to disappoint you if you expect any other guy, but hopefully it's be interesting for you guys too. So I'm going to be talking to you about social engineering, but something slightly different. And uh, so sort of hacking computers like probably most of you used to, hacking humans, so hacking your mind. Great. <laughs> Same problem as you. Okay. So first off, like most people, this is all my own research, so some things you may or may not agree with, but it's all me, nothing to do with my employer or any of the customers I work with. And what I'm really going to try and talk about is that language is a strange thing. So even just by listening to what I'm saying now and reading what's on the slide, things are happening that you're not aware of subconsciously. And this is really a, a dangerous thing. So if we can understand how the brain works and how we process these things, we can be a lot more effective in our social engineering activities. So those of you who haven't heard of me before, um, I'm on the Euro Trash Security Podcast. If you came to the podcast meetup last night, you've heard my lovely voice before. And hopefully some of you have been to the Head Hacker website, so you know a little bit what I'm going to be talking about today. But um, so, 9 to 5, I work in information security like a lot of you. And then when I'm not doing that, I concentrate a lot over the last 24, 36 months doing social engineering. Okay. <laughs> and this is happening already. So what I'm going to be talking about is a few things. The different types of social engineers I see it, and really what the best tool I think for the job is when it comes to social engineering. And then the main sort of portion of the talk is going to be my, my journey to enlightenment. So I'm going to be talking about neuro-linguistic programming. Can I anyone familiar with NLP? Show of hands. Okay. Uh, hypnosis. Couple, okay. And then um, mentalism as well. So if any of you have heard of Darren Brown? Yeah, so you know what mentalism is. Talk a little bit about, more about that. I'm just trying to give you some sort of ideas or have you thinking throughout this talk, how could you apply this day to day or in meetings or if you're in, interested in social engineering, how you can you utilize these skills? And really just trying to encourage everyone to, when you understand how some of this stuff works, is to get you thinking differently day to day. So if you're being what I call mindful, you can be aware of these attacks are happening, so you're less susceptible. So, just for clarification, as you know, if you read my site, I always reference Wikipedia, because <laughs> it's just there. So, social engineering is basically about lying, so to convince someone that you are someone else, or you should be there, or you should have access, but when you hear some of the stories about some people's social engineering engagements, it's like they must have some sort of Jedi powers, just let me through, I belong here. And really, I think, this is kind of what got me thinking about it, is how, do they, how does this happen? How can you be more effective? How can you really have these Jedi powers? So, in my day job, we do um, some social engineering engagements, but a lot of the time our customers require us to get a third party to come and do it so that it's like, unbiased. So I meet lots of different types of social engineers. And I think, really, I think I'm trying to classify it as five different types of social engineer. So the first type, you've probably all seen her. It's normally quite an attractive person. And if you're a guy, I'm sure if this girl comes up to you, you're pretty much going to let her do whatever she wants. But so really this is sort of the opportunist social engineer. So they're using their physical skills. They're available. They're not caught up doing something else. So, um, you know, you can just go and use your attractiveness to get into this building. They've got an idea of the concept of social engineering or how they're going to bypass some security controls. But they don't do this every day. And some people, this might be the first time they've ever done it. So there's an engagement that maybe the company doesn't think is so high priority 
and there's someone who's enthusiastic and they think, okay, just go ahead and do it. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing because I'm sure which most of you realize with social engineering is companies are so bad at awareness. So even this opportunist person who's got little skills doesn't really have too much problem getting into some of these buildings and that's really one of the worrying things. But, you know, if they're challenged, they're probably going to run away or, okay, this didn't work, they're not going to try and persist and move forward. So then we have the second type. Someone with natural confidence. You've all met them. They're American. No, okay. So, some of these people, they just, they just talk the talk. They are so confident about everything, they could probably tell you they're a national and they, they believe they are, but Really, they're not, but they're, so they talk lots of things. One of the common things is they're all talk. I've done this, I've broken into hundreds of companies, but really they haven't really done it in their mind, perhaps they have, but they're so confident they will try and convince you that they can do these things, which comes in handy because one of the key things is for social engineering, you have to be a good communicator. So you're lying to convince someone to believe that lie is real. So they're good at that and are comfortable interacting with people because normally these natural confidence people love themselves so if they want to have people talk to me and that's just great but again similar to the first one they don't really have say expertise they don't do this very often so again they may just be a natural selection because you can talk to all these different customers you've had before so you might be a good fit I'm a manager, I can't say that. <laughs> yes, you're right, just like me. Then you've got, I guess, the third one, which I think is we're kind of going to get more common now that you find lots of the people who are interested in social engineering are a professional geeky type of guy. So they've got some info set skills, so it's not just about the social engineering thing. Once they get in there, they've got an idea of what they're going to do how they're going to get access to the network or something like that. So they've got an interest and probably some passion. And I've normally got a process or at least an idea of, okay, I need to do some research, get information on the customer. This is the sort of story I'm going to tell. I'm trying to convince them that I should be here. So they will have done a bit of homework. And so they're knowledgeable. But what I'm trying to get at with um, part of what I'm going to be talking about here is they things happen but they're not quite sure why they happen so it's more of an art you know last time I did this they seem to let me in here so I'll try it again they're not quite sure why it worked or why it didn't work then we've got the ninjas we have, everyone loves the ninja so these are the more seasoned professionals so social engineering probably plays a large part of their role so they're constantly doing this so in their mind at least they have a repeatable process so similar to the, the professional they know if I pretend to be the water cooler guy, I can come through here or if I'm giving a delivery, that normally works. So they have repetition on their side. And like I said already, they have experience. So because they're doing this quite often, they've got the, they have the confidence and things that you're looking for already. And they're able to handle confrontation, which is one of the important things. So when someone challenges you, they don't just shit themselves and go, okay, okay, I wasn't supposed to be here really. They, they have a sort of kind of a game plan. So they're going to say, oh, they may have their jail, get our jail free card that has been altered, so it's not really the real one. They have a, something to back it up. Because they're passionate about it, they're enjoying what they're doing. It's not just a job, so normally they're going to be more successful. But one of the negatives, some of these seasoned pros, they think they know everything. So you try and tell them, okay, you might want to try this. No, 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 it works. This, I know everything. So they're kind of turned off. So then comes to type number five, I said Darren Brown already. So I think the best type of social engineer, what we should all be aspiring to, is to be this master manipulator. So what is a master manipulator? So like I said before, some people have this art, but not the science. So a master manipulator knows why things work and don't work. They test lots of things. So when something fails, they know why it fails. So then as part of their process, they'll be reading um, what their subject that they're interacting with is happening so they can adjust their game plan to make it more successful not just based on experience of understanding why it's going to be more successful so like I say you have this game plan 
And what this is really about is how when things go wrong, it's not just an A, B, C process. You know how to get from A, there may be multiple routes to B. So it's not just A, B, oh shit, that didn't work. You might go A, A1, A2, A3 to C and just skip B altogether. Multiple outs. And again, similar to the, the skilled professional guy, you know, they're passionate and dedicated to this. It's not just this is my job. They're reading, they're researching these things, understanding you know, how the mind's working, all these type of things. And they try and test these things, not just in a social engineering engagement. They're out doing this in the evenings, just manipulating people or uh, monitoring people, looking how they're working. So they're constantly evolving what they're doing. So it's not just, I just do security. They're looking about how do people move, um, so like body language, micro expressions, um, talking to psychologists, understanding why people react a certain way, what's happening, you know, what we're really thinking about in our minds. And they get creative, so that's why some of the stories you hear, the good social engineers, they do some really far out weird stuff. That, that's the creative thing, is sometimes these things are so far out you think it couldn't possibly be real. And that's part of the reason why some of these things work, because it's just so out there, you've got more chance of success. But one of the bad things about a lot of mass manipulators is they're real cocky bastards, because I know everything. It's so... They almost think, that even though they're, they're constantly learning, they don't want to speak to these lower people that, you know, you've got nothing to, to teach me because you're just as opportunist. So what I'm trying to talk about and what my research has been over probably most of the last 24 months is how do we get to be the master manipulator? How can we utilize the power of our minds, the words we say, the words people read, and the observation to make ourselves so successful or have a real good opportunity of being successful on a constant basis. So obviously a lot of these things, there's so much information. I wanted to talk about body language and micro expressions and everything, but due to time, I'm just trying to talk to you about the journey that I had over the last 24 months of really researching deep down into NLP hypnosis mainly and then um, the mentors and stuff, but how you can utilize this in social engineering. So, like any good professional, the tool is really important. And even though we're all clever people, most of us are not really mindful. We're not really using our brains. We're just like cattle. We're just following everyone else. This is what we do. I just follow these people. So, the best tool for this job as a social engineer is your mind. So, you can be thinking on your feet and then understanding how you can manipulate the mind to get what you want. So, I'm sure a lot of people here are probably sceptical about some of the things I'm talking about. So, sceptical about hypnosis, does it work, does it not work? So, just to give a little bit of information about the three types of the brain that I want you to be thinking about throughout this is a part of the brain we call the limbic system. So, this is sort of like, they call it the old part of the brain. And this is the sort of primeval animal instinct part of our brain that reacts whether we're going to run away or fight something. So it's more of the reactive nature. We don't really think, it just happens. And our subconscious mind. So this is really the powerhouse of our mind. So even now, every second, we're taking in 11 million pieces of information. Seems like loads. I mean, that just shows how powerful the brain is. But the interesting thing is that our subconscious is taking out all this information but it only feeds through to us somewhere in between 60 to 40 individual pieces of information which makes us form our reality. So really, when we talk about hypnosis or using language, what we're doing is we're manipulating the subconscious to make these 16 to 14 pieces of information the priority for our objective. So instead of the reality that we're normally ignoring people if they're trying to get into a building or we don't believe them, what we're doing is we're altering these information to make our information a priority, so we're hacking the mind. So, just before I go into the, the different steps, one of the important things with social engineering, especially when it comes to head hacking, commitment is of the utmost importance. So when we're trying to manipulate someone, we need to be 100% focused on them, and we need them to be 100% focused on us. We need them to be committed to the story we're telling them or the lie that we're telling them. 
We need to have a planned path about what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to achieve it. So like I said before, you've got multiple outs you want to get from A to C, but you've got all the different routes to get in there. And you're putting yourself in a position where you can persuade them to believe um, the lie that you're telling them. So if you're here to, if you're an engineer, understanding how you're going to persuade them to be, that you're going to be an engineer. If you were trying to persuade, if someone was trying to persuade you, sorry, think about that. What steps some information is going to be important? And the most important thing is, even if it's not so much um, the fact that they believe who you are, it's getting agreement at any level. So as soon as, as soon as you start to get agreement from people, even if it's just the fact that we're here, so you agree that I'm here and you're listening to me, yes, that's already a large percentage of what we're trying to achieve. Another thing, choosing the right ear. As strange as it sounds, um, if you speak to someone focused in on the right ear, there's a, you, I, think you, I think the percentage is like 30% more chance of them doing what you want them to do because the left hand side of the brain is dealing with the language you're putting in and it makes a more a logical decision. Whereas if you were to speak into the left ear, it's the right side of your brain that makes a decision and it doesn't process in the same way. So you're actually somehow reducing your success. So it's, it's worth trying in meetings. It does work. Is it also worth to think about telephoning with the left hand side there? Yeah, I mean, it's the same whenever you're using language, the brain is just f the way it processes. So right ear, left-hand side of the brain. So normally, the general rule is I think it's about probably 85% of the people work that way. So obviously there is that room for error. So if you're interacting with people and you're trying to influence them, try and position yourself, you know, if you're on the right ear as opposed to the left ear, just all these little things, that little nuggets to help improve. And the other thing is, if ever you guys have heard of this guy called Robert... Caldini. He does lots of research on persuasion. And one of the key things he says is that we stay true to what we say. So if, if just as part of the opening introductions that you say to people, okay, if just, can you just take a moment of your time to listen to me? Yes. So because they've verbally agreed to do it, subconsciously you've, they've made a commitment. So it's all these things about getting them committed so that when you kind of try and do your proper foo, You've, you've set up this stack that they're going to follow. And the most important thing for any of these things is to make the leap for them. So if you want them to believe that you should be in the building or you want to believe or you want them to give you information, you need to believe yourself that you should have access to that information. You should be there. Because what happens subconsciously is you're giving off all these signals and if you don't believe you're not supposed to be there, subconsciously people are picking up on that. If you've ever had this feeling when you're speaking to someone, even if you've not studied any of this, you, know, you get that feeling where you think, this guy's just talking out his ass. You know, I don't believe what he's saying. I don't agree with this. Um, and what's happening there is subconsciously, you know, your body's picking up on all these little signals. And so you do, you give off these signals that, oh, I'm not really supposed to be here. I hope he really gives me the information or whatever. So if you really believe this should be happening, you really increase your success rate. So you've got to make the leap. You've got to go there first before they follow along and believe with the same story. And the main thing with all this stuff I found is the important thing is this big because. Everything happens for a reason. So um, a quick example of this uh, is some research I think it's done a few years ago. You, most of you have probably heard about it is when there's a big line at the photocopier and you just run to the front of the photocopier because you want to make a photocopy. And people are like, what are you doing here? I just need to be here. You get pushed away. If you simply go up to the front and say, because I need to make a photocopy, it doesn't make any sense. But because you've explained or given a reason of why I'm here, that because I'm here is because I have to make a copy, even though it's obvious, something subconsciously happens where people kind of think, oh, right, okay. It, it's a strange thing, but you'll find is that if you verify why something's going to happen, so like with hypnosis, um, as part of like, the pacing and leading process, you're explaining why someone is going to be stuck to the floor because this has happened. So you're building up this process where this has happened, this has happened. So because of this, our mind says, yes, this can happen. So what I wanted to do, again, constantly trying to research. So hopefully you guys can participate in this. And I keep my fingers crossed. 
What I want you to do, everyone knows what their index finger is? It sounds silly, but I ask people about index finger and they might never be quite sure what finger it is. So just in case you're not sure, this is your index finger. So can everyone show me their index finger? That's not your index finger, Chris. <laughs> okay. So what you need to do, just concentrate on what I'm saying and have a little look what you see on the screen. So, here we have the word mind. So we've got the letters M, I, N and D. And if I was to ask you to look at those four letters and extend your index finger and select any of those four letters, if you were to do that now, okay? So, let's get a show of hands. Put your hand up if you selected M. Okay, couple. Put your hand up if you selected I. Okay. Put your hand up if you selected N. Okay, a lot of people. Put your hand up if you selected D. Oh, okay, quite a lot of people who are D as well. So, if you put your hand up for N, well done. You're susceptible to what I was telling you. And I'm not going to explain how this worked here, but... Because it said M, I, N, N, D. Everyone thinks that. The first bit I said, nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay. okay? Uh, if you want to ask me afterwards, I'll explain how you can do this. And you can try it out with your friend. It's real simple, but this is just a, a clear example of how using just sort of changes in what you're saying in a sentence, your subconscious is being bombarded with the N instruction. So then when you make your free choice, like I've reprioritized the information subconsciously, so then hopefully, if it works, you're thinking N. So this is just about how we can use language to subconsciously alter the result based on what you may have already selected. So let's go into the sort of crux of it. NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. So some of you who already know about, about it, sorry if this is repetitive, but for you that don't. So two guys invented, came up with NLP. One guy called Richard Bandler and the other guy, John Grinder. So they came up with neuro-linguistic programming. And these guys, um, one was a lecturer and one was a student. And basically what they did was they studied therapists. So they weren't scientists. They went and listened to like... Um, Milton Erickson and other sort of real popular therapists back in the 80s and all they were listening to is the sentences they used and the words they used and how they used them and then they just went off and got like other students and just repeated the same words, the same structures and found how they had these results of people feeling better or changing phobias and things and they, so they came up with these kind of I guess scripts or patterns Lots of people think, I guess nowadays, especially like since NLP has become more popular, that NLP is a science. It's a science of change. We're really, I, I personally don't think it's a science. NLP is more of a, an art and a process. Why do some of these things work? I'm sure like scientists can give you reasons why mentally it's working, but this is just, it's language. It's not science. It's not something you can particularly calculate. These things just work through how you're delivering them and the words that you use. So it's a, it's a process. And one of the important things that they really found, especially for any manipulation as they're getting changed, is rapport is really important. So we like people that like us, and we like people that are like us. So we like each other because we're geeks and nobody else does. Uh, so one of these things that's really important with any manipulation is to, to build what they call rapport. So what we're getting here is these these two monkeys have got rapport because they're mimicking each other. So you'll, you'll probably find um, if you're sat next to someone like a friend and you're talking and like, you know, you put your hand on your face then a few minutes later or seconds they're putting their hand on their face. Because what's happening is subconsciously we're picking up on all these signals and we like to mirror each other. So when we've got good rapport, we mirror each other. So it's important when you're trying to manipulate people to build up rapport quickly. And that doesn't mean... You know, if you walk up to a security guard and he's stood like this, you stand like this because he knows you're taking a piss. So you may kind of just follow a stance that's similar. So maybe you stand like this. So you're, you're mimicking, but you're not taking the piss. And that's, that's the balance. I think lots of people think, 
this won't work because if I walk up to someone and got this, you know, they just think you're taking a piss. So this is one of the key things with any any manipulation you're going to do is to establish a rapport to make to build some link so they like you and they have a level of respect. And then what's happened with NLP is they talk about frames. Uh, and I call this something slightly different, but basically we all have a frame of our existence, our reality based on the information we get from everything around us and our subconscious feeding us these 14 to 60 things. We've built up a frame of how we're living our life and that's how we go through things. So from a therapy perspective, you know, if, you've got, if you're afraid of spiders, that's become your frame. So every day you're not walking around going, oh, there's a spider. You know, this is happening subconsciously. And then when you see a spider, these things trigger. So, what they, so basically what they were doing with NLP and these scripts was something they call reframing. So they're changing your frame of reality using language to make it go from having a phobia. It's not having a phobia. So they call it reframing. I call it, um, which I'll talk about a bit later, is everyone's got their own game. We're all playing our own game. We've all got our own objectives. So everyone that's here has got a different objective. And basically, when we're trying to manipulate people, we need to get people playing our game. And that might sound quite difficult, but something as simple as like a reframe could be if someone's stand like this and they're not, you're not really listening, just getting them to say, oh no, could you just stand like this? I've, I've altered you from your game is this, to now my game. So already I've started the process of reframing the experience. So when I'm trying to manipulate you, you're already subconsciously doing what I've asked. You've, I've asked you to put your feet together, you've done it. I've asked you to, to check something, you can check it. And one of the things, it might sound too obvious, because a lot of this stuff is with NLP and stuff is, ask people, what's, you know, if, they're, if they're saying, oh, look, you can't come in, you haven't got a badge, well, what's, what would it take to make this happen? We need a badge. Well, they haven't got one, so what's it going to take? Maybe, and they will give you the information that they need to make it happen. So don't try and guess that, oh, that perhaps they need a special letter or a phone call. Just ask them outright, and they, they will give an answer at some level as to what it's going to take to make it so. So uh, just a quick couple of examples. If you've seen the website, some of this stuff will be familiar to you, but there's four patterns that I think can be useful with social engineering. One is the sort of redefinement pattern. So just an example is if you turn up somewhere and say you pretend to be an engineer and perhaps you haven't got a letter or you haven't, you know, they haven't, they're not expecting you, you change the focus of, okay, so I know you're not expecting me, but think about the problems that we're going to have if I don't replace this router. Can you imagine the building, you know, I mean, the, the company not working because this router hasn't been replaced? So what you're doing is you're changing the focus. It's not about the fact that you haven't got a badge. It's changing the focus about... What well, if this doesn't work? What happens if the company is now losing money? Are you going to answer to you know, the CEO when he comes downstairs? So it's getting, again, it's getting people, you're changing them from their game, and their focus is no badge to play your game. The agreement pattern, and this one really just to me just makes perfect sense. If you don't agree with what I'm telling you now, which is fine, as soon as you start telling me that you don't agree, I'm not interested, I'm not listening. So what you do is you start off your challenge with agreeing, even the fact that you don't agree. So I agree that I do not agree with what you're talking about, and subconsciously already we're listening, so we're not, we're not turning off. So then we utilize that agreement to then input our idea. So you can agree that you don't agree with what I'm saying, and then tell me why you think something should be done slightly differently, and that sort of information will be fed through to me and become a positive for me. Awareness is another one that is, is similar to the mind thing. So you're bringing awareness to keywords. So that's like with tonality. So you'll just say things more and, you know, emphasize them. So, you know, I haven't got my badge, but I need to get in. You know, like Americans do that. I don't know if the, like the question type thing at the end. Sorry, so I'm, I'm not Americanist, but it is a prime example of how utilization of the language to focus on keywords as opposed to the sentence. And the other one, which is just great, and it works. And if any of you guys are a fan of Darren Brown, he gives a great example in one of his books. Interruption. So you just create confusion. So it, like, his example is, if someone stops you, 
or you know if you've seen one of his videos these guys are stealing some stuff from the shop and one of the guys gets stopped his, and the guy's like what are you doing with that chocolate bar my wall it's four feet tall and this guy's like the fuck it's like yeah like my wall at home's four feet tall not like this one here that's like six foot but like i've got a small one and basically what you've done is you've interrupted their game so their process is you've stolen this chocolate bar i need it back why did you do it and you've basically Stop them right at the beginning. So they're, they're, they have a brain fart moment. And in that sort of blank space moment, that's where you can utilize uh, the confusion to input something or just use the opportunity to, to run away. Basically, you're derailing their, their set path. So like I said, they've got their path to get from A to B, and you just stopped it. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so he he was saying. Oh, have you got a microphone or? Okay, I said if you use um, interruption and confusion, um, then you need to put up a high pressure on it, and if you yeah, leave so the victim some time to think about it, then you're lost. Yeah. So basically, what you're doing here, you're, you're absolutely right. When you cause interruption, this 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 gap is somewhere between one to three seconds. And this is your opportunity to inject your code, essentially. So you've created a gap of white noise to then put in what you want to happen. So you're, like you're saying, you're taking focus, and if someone thinks about something for long enough, then yeah, their brain starts kicking in and back to their game. So NLP, it's all good, but so disappointing. So when I'm, I first started looking into NLP, I thought, oh, this stuff can't work. And then you start to experience it. And just a prime example I first had of it is I play squash twice a week. And I really hate losing. And I get real pissed off. So I um, had this, um, I think it was a, this guy called Tad James. He's an NLP practitioner. And he had this, this language pattern for stuff like this. And I just sat down and repeated it myself, you know, five times. And next time I played squash, I really enjoyed it. I wasn't angry. And it kind of, I'm not sure... You know exactly whether it's me convincing myself or you know how the reprogramming happens but that's when I kind of thought this stuff could really work but then you speak to these other NLP practitioners and basically if you don't believe in the gospel of Bandler you know they're not interested so they are very much set on this is how it works and if you try and speak to them about oh, I do social engineering and I like to I experience this not interested and so it really disappointed me that these people didn't want to learn, they didn't want to expand. You know, this is all about changing and reframing. And I was like, great, so we can reframe the information that we've experienced. And they're like, no. So I was kind of really disappointed. But one of the last sort of um, meetings I went to with NLP practitioners, I met this one guy, and um, I was talking to him about social engineering, and and he was really interested. And he had just recently started... Uh, learning hypnosis and I was like yeah hypnosis it's all rubbish just people barking like dogs and clucking like chickens and great but he said something that really sort of interests me is no hypnosis is a really powerful tool you know it's language it's just like NLP the processes and everything and I'm like yeah but NLP I, I thought it was really good and I've taken what it, from it what I think is benefit but I'm, I'm really disheartened with these guys and he's like yeah but Imagine with social engineering, if you could just ask someone, so don't worry about trying to manipulate them particularly or get information out of them once you broke into them. I want you to just ask them to give you the password. Just... And I'm like, okay, so I need to put a gun to their head and then they're going to tell me. But he said it's something interesting. I think he's right. We always answer at some level. So even if you, know, if you ask someone, you know, do you like me? And they might say yes, but their body language is telling you something else. So we always have to answer at some level. And this is what really got me interested in um, looking at hypnosis. So, like I said, I'd heard about hypnosis before, and it's like intriguing. I'm like, yeah, but everyone's playing along, stage shows and stuff. So I thought, right, I need to become a hypnotist. Let's find out if this stuff is really for real. So I started, um, like, like all of you guys, you surf the internet, you find these forums of all these people that think they can hypnotize people and they reckon they're 
shagging girls at college and stuff because they hypnotise them. So I thought, okay, so what is hypnosis? And hypnosis has been around before like the 1840s, but this is really when it started to become more aware of, of what the process of hypnosis was. And basically the, the word came from what they called neurohypnotism, and it came up this is actually someone in Scotland, I was going to say the UK, but Scottish people don't like that, so in Scotland. So this guy called James, he was a surgeon, and he sort of came up with this, I guess, you know, the language of hypnosis, or, and how his experience of it, and that's when it got officially sort of termed as hypnosis is the term. And neurohypnotism, I think it's called nervous sleep, that's what, it's, that's what the, the meaning of it is. So basically what, what hypnosis is, everyone thinks that when I ask people about, have you been hypnotised, oh I don't want to be hypnotised because I lose control and I'm asleep and everything's gone blank. And this is because, you know, we have this whole thing of a wave, the clock now, if you just look here and everything's going to go blank, and then you'll wake up an hour later and you've been doing all sorts of strange things. But really, it's really focusing on your subconscious, and it really is a, it's a real focused state of attention, not something that, oh I don't know what's happening, it's really a simple... That's what the kit is for, keep it simple, stupid. It's a focused state of attention that, like I said before, we need the commitment. So people are so focused on what we're saying that all this stuff is just going in to the subconscious and we're reprioritizing the information that's coming through to the conscious mind so that we can manipulate people. And really, the brain is, um, this is why like, you can't use hypnosis for statements, you know, when you um, work with the police. You know, people can't use hypnosis to recall something because our brain is really good at filling in gaps so if you were to say to someone under hypnosis you at this crime scene you remember the white car the brain will say oh he, ne he really needs a white car we'll make that happen so this is why it isn't true because we're being really vague and making assumptions and they're just making our brain connect the link so you just hear a lot of hypnotists say I'm not sure which one it may be your left or your right leg may be becoming you know, stuck to the floor. It's this, it's a vagueness, but at the same time there's intent this is going to happen. So, and our mind just fills in the blanks. So when I was um, reading about hypnosis, it's, um, lots of it is obviously all therapy. You go and see a hypnotherapist, which is also another great thing. So I spoke to some hypnotherapists, and I'm like, right, show me hypnosis, Hypno hypnotize me now. Oh no, it doesn't work like that. You need to lay down and I'll speak to you for an hour and you'll be all calm. And I'm like, that isn't going to help me. I haven't got time to get someone to lay down. So then I found out really about this form of rapid induction. So literally, you know, we're talking seconds to a minute of boshing someone under. And this is where one of the, th the key things for rapid induction is, like I said, getting feedback, asking people. So everyone is slightly different because they're playing their own game. So inspecting what's happening. So when I'm talking to you, you know, what are you feeling now? What's happening? And people come up with this, the strangest things like, I feel like a tree. Okay, if that, if that works for you, that's, that's the word we need to use. And the main thing with hypnosis is keep it simple and with language in general. So don't, you don't need a, a long story about why I should be here because that doesn't happen in real life. Just keep it simple, keep it plain, easy to understand and just really focused on our objective. So a few of the people... So I was researching, probably this is just almost two years ago, this guy called Dave Alman, and the reason he was so sort of influential back then was because um, he was one of the first guys that apparently this guy had a heart transplant just under hypnosis because he, he was um, allergic to anaesthetics, this, this patient. So this guy Dave Alman hypnotized this guy and he had a heart transplant with um, no anaesthetics. Now, obviously the mind can overcome a lot of pain, but really the skin feels lots of pain internally. You know, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert, but <laughs> internally, like, internal body parts don't feel the same sort of pain. So it's not really, you might be thinking, rubbish, there's no way this guy could have had his heart replaced under hypnosis. But this is, so he basically worked for most of his hypnotic career, because he was a radio broadcaster as well, but most of his hypnotic career with surgeons. So writing, he wrote this book just for surgeons on hypnotherapy, and that's, I think he only really had one book published. And that's the book I was reading about how he was doing hypnosis, but it was very much focused on, you know, people in the medical industry. 
And then, if any of you know about hypnosis, you would have heard of Milton Erickson, if you know about NLP, Milton Erickson, because Richard Bandler and that, they studied Milton Erickson's work, and he was really famous for the stories he would tell, so people would say, you go and see about him for therapy, and he didn't really hypnotize you, you went in the room, and he'd tell you a story that just doesn't seem to make sense, and you'd come out, and you would have been hypnotized. So he was really the guy that he made the most changes in hypnosis. So I was reading all his stuff, and I was like, wow, this is great. So I need to go and try it. So I'm out speaking to people. I'm a hypnotist. I've never done it before. And so I'm going to hypnotize you now. And you do all these things and just concentrate on my hand and sleep. And they're like, no. And I'm like, shit, this isn't good. <laughs> and then, so I kind of obviously got disheartened with this process. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, like I said all along, hypnosis is rubbish. It doesn't work. I can't do it. Then what happened about a year and a half ago, this guy called Anthony Jackman, he's in the UK, and he's, his dad's a hypnotist, he released this book called Reality is Plastic, and it was all focused on rapid induction. Great, exactly what I'm looking for. And it was really his work that I read that things really started just to come together. So then I was going out, trying things with people, and it was working. And I was like, wow, hypnosis really does work, what can I do with it? But then I had the problem of, you go up to somebody, and I'm thinking, how can I use this for social media? I can't just walk up to somebody and say, okay, I just want you to close your eyes for a minute. <laughs> okay, you're, you're going to do something to me. Um, and so I met up with this guy, Anthony Jackwin, at um, a magic convention in the UK, Blackpool Magic Convention, huge place. And he introduced me to this other guy. Well, actually, no, sorry. So first of all, I heard about this guy called David Kaloff, and he was he's an American guy as well. And he did this um, open eyes hypnosis. And I thought, that's interesting, but he hasn't really got any books, just courses. And I can't fly to the States for these courses. And that's it. I was talking to Anthony Jackman about David Kaloff. And in Blackpool, I met this guy called James Tripp. Again, another guy in the UK. And he does this stuff called Hypnosis Without Trance. And I was speaking to him about, okay, I've, you try and hypnotize these people and it doesn't work. And then, so how successful can I be with this? And he was speaking about how, you know, as soon as you mention hypnosis, like, people put up a barrier, because like, you're going to cluck like a chicken or bark like a dog or something. So, so mentally, we, we're mentally preparing ourselves for this. So if we're trying to social engineer people and try and use some hypnotic language, if, we, if you use the word hypnosis, people have this horror, horror picture in their mind. And what he showed me was how um, just about using language, you know, the next thing you know, someone has their hand stuck to a table. Are you hypnotized? No? Because they're awake, it's, you know, the eyes open. So I went on a few of his courses, and this is where it's, things really started to come clear to me, is in my mind, I don't really think there is any such thing as hypnosis. There, it isn't, and it isn't. So basically, you might say, I've never ever been hypnotized. But if you've ever been driving to work, and then all of a sudden you're at work, and you're kind of like, oh, well, I must have been on autopilot. That, that is what hypnosis is. We're constantly, I don't like the word trance, but different things are happening to us all the time, you know, a mind for the mindless state. And that's when I really realized that all this stuff is just language. It's just focused attention and language. So we haven't got to be saying, oh, I'm going to hypnotize you to let me in. You can just use the language to, to get people and to persuade them, to misdirect them, and give them the perception that something should be happening and, and you're an authoritative figure. And the other thing about the brain, it's a weird thing, it doesn't do negatives too well. So, if I was to ask you all the question, I don't want you to think of a pink elephant. And what's happening in your mind, whether you really realize it, is you're thinking, right, okay, pink elephant, but don't think about the pink elephant. So just the, just the, the word, think, uh, you know, don't think, because the think of pink elephant is in the word, um, that's, you just have to think it. So if you're saying to someone, oh, you, know, you don't have to let me in, there's some intention there of let me in. So subconsciously these things are all happening. So really, we can speak in negatives but still get a positive outcome. Okay. So how does all this stuff work? And how do we hypnotize people? How do we get, how do we manipulate people? How do we get people to do what we want to do? Now, 
we've all got this thing that's the guardian of our mind. It's called the critical factor. And this is, I guess, the firewall between the subconscious and the conscious mind. And basically what we do is this process called pacing and leading. And what we do is we bypass this critical factor. So we call it like a yes set. So if you're speaking to someone, you could say, OK, you're all here now. You're all sat in this room. You're all listening to me talking. And you're all breathing. And you're thinking, yes, yes, yes. Everything this guy is saying is absolutely true. Without the shadow of that, I know I'm breathing, I'm here. What happens is that bypasses the critical factor because the mind sort of turns off. I'm not, I don't need to pay attention anymore because everything this guy is saying is true, so whatever else he tells me must be true. And this, what happens here, when you bypass the critical factor, that's when you can start injecting your courage into the subconscious mind because it becomes in a, like a mind, less mindful state. So, what can we do to create this sort of buffer overflow of the mind? So, we said, said before about this pattern interrupt where you know, someone comes to ask you a question and you just say something com completely shit that just makes no sense. And you've interrupted the pattern to create this opportunity to inject your code. Another way of doing it is our brain deals with information in pictures, sounds, smells, but mainly stories. That's why you know, things are passed down generations and generations in stories. So there's this whole concept of the brain just can't handle more than somewhere between five to seven things at once. So what we do is we just open loops. So we start telling people stories, but we don't finish them. And we just keep on going on from one to another. And what happens, our brain is storing all this, all this information up, thinking, right, it needs to come to an end, but I need to keep it there for a minute. And then you sort of Again, you create this mindless state because so much stuff's going on, your brain is just confused, then you create these opportunities. And again, this is like I say, this is this processing limit, your brain just cannot handle things. Well the other way is you speak in ambiguous terms. So things that you're not saying this is gonna happen or this isn't gonna happen and and you're making the person's mind have to make their own decision up. And it just creates this confusion state where people aren't really what, sure what's going on and they're all confused. And you're pretty confused as well. And then you can use this opportunity then to make the suggestion or try and influence the person to do what you're asking. And like I said before, you're creating this yes set, so everything this guy is saying makes sense, so why would anything else, if he was, if he was to tell me I'm stuck here, why not? Everything else he said was true. I know it sounds strange, but this is, it is really is this simple. When, when I was first learning it, it's like, well, this can't work, because where's the, where's the magic stuff? but it's just our brain is so susceptible. So one of the key things when you're trying to do this is reinforcement is really, really key. So like I said, it's pacing and leading things. So you, you know the path, you're leading them down it. And like I said, some people make really direct suggestions and some people are indirect. So some people will just say, you're going to sleep, you're going to be stuck there, you're going to do this. Or you can take the more ambiguous approach, which is what I prefer. So you're kind of going under the radar Another really important thing is to share the experience. So if you're telling someone that they've forgotten something, live that experience. So like, you know, you've forgotten, forgotten what that was I was saying now? So your, your body signals and stuff, you're sharing the experience, you're going there first. Like I said, it's like making this leap. And also to share the perspective of the person you're trying to influence. So if you're, if you're explaining something to someone over there, don't just be looking at them and pointing. Be, be looking at it from their angle, so that way you're getting the same information they are, and you can customise what you're talking about to reflect it and be more influential. And like I said, the key to all these things is we're all playing our own game, and to, to manipulate people and suggest things and get them to support our perspective, we just need to get them to play our game at any level. So it is, like I said, as simple as someone standing straight as opposed to sat down or sitting down if they're stood up. All these things just help us progress to what we're trying to achieve. Now, one thing um, people say about hypnosis is you can't make someone under hypnosis do something that they don't want to do. Okay. So, how can I influence someone with language if they don't want to let me in? If, they're, if, they're, if they know they're not supposed to let me in. So basically, you use commands to alter their reality. So like I said before, you can ask them, what would it take to make this happen? And then make that be their reality. So people give these clues away. So if, um, like when you're doing research, how can I get in? Oh, you need a badge. Okay. 
So you know what reality needs to happen for them. So just have a badge. It doesn't have to be the badge they're expecting, but it, it starts building up this yes set of the guy's got a badge, he's supposed to be here, say he's supposed to be here, he knows the information. So basically you're modifying the game we're playing. So their reality is, I wouldn't let that happen. Okay? Uh, and just get them to, to follow your process. And one of the interesting sort of things I've found is there's this process um, in like a hypnotic thing called truth and lies. So I've used this to get um, passwords from people. So you ask them with their password, you're going to say no. I'm not going to give you the password. But what you can do is you set up this, this set where you, you switch off. So I'm going to ask you to be the biggest liar in the world. So what size feet have you got? Size 12. Are you a man or a woman? I'm a woman. So you build up this set of you're telling the biggest lies and then when you alter that scenario to be a truth teller these things slip through, it's mindless so you ask the same set of questions and then you inject this random code at the end what is your password and the information just flows out because the brain has just switched off and this subconscious information is just flowing through so what can you do with hypnosis? so if you're not familiar with hypnosis there's all the different things that come out of it we call phenomena so what can you do? there's a little bit of something for everybody so you can give people amnesia so they forget what happened. You can make someone stiff. Uh, why might that be useful? So you could uh, do all sorts of interesting things. But uh, one of the examples here is um, in like one of some of the stuff I've shown. Uh, if you've seen the videos, is you know, sticking people somewhere or making so an instruction so you could have a, a set command that. You know, given a certain type of language or suggestion, they would become stuck, or they couldn't move. Making people do, like a lot of common hypnotists make people's arms lift, you know, without people realizing that's idiomotor, idiomotor stuff. We spoke about it before, anesthesia, you can make people so they're numb, they can't feel these things. Hallucinations. So, a bit like, if any of you guys are a fan of Doctor Who, you know he's got that sort of telepathy wallet thing where he just shows it to them and it is whatever they believe so you could show someone a badge and have them believe it was the badge that they're expecting to see even though it, it wasn't or, or not believing um, that you were there so as crazy it sounds making yourself invisible to the person sounds crazy and I'm not, still not quite sure how it works and even when I do it I'm not convinced it's really working but you know you can make, it, you know, you can make things appear make things disappear this is more for therapy stuff about you know regressions of people uh, that have had problems as in their childhood. Hopefully, a few of you know what this is. Anyone? Excellent. So you can make time distort time. So um, another funny thing you see these guys walking around town advertising a shop. Those guys, it's a pretty boring job. So wouldn't it be cool if you were to hypnotise them so that they think that the 10 hours walking around with that piece of card was really 10 minutes? That'd be quite cool. And then, we all like zombies, so we could use um, post-hypnotic suggestion. So, so the way I look at this is, um, I'd obviously don't say, I'm not saying you're going to walk into, into a company and just walk up to the security guard and go, <coughs> sleep. So what you need to do is, you, you find my approach is finding these people in their natural setting, bars and pubs, absolutely great. And then sort of my approach is to say to these people, I'm a performer, I'm going to show you a magic trick. And you do some magic and hypnosis, and then when you hypnotize them and they're having fun in the bar, you could give this post-hypnotic suggestion that um, next time I see you and say a word, you flip back to this state. So this is why cool. If you see um, like hypnotists on stage, a lot of them will do sort of pre-hypnosis. So like, unless you're really good, you, know, you don't just walk up to someone and say, sleep and they just fall to the ground. So you give this post-hypnotic suggestion that the next time I say sleep, you will revert back to this state. And you can use this and create your own sort of zombie army if you were to hypnotize everyone in the pub that works at this company and then like when you walk in, everyone just falls back to this hypnotic state. <laughs> okay. I've got some videos on um, YouTube and stuff if you're interested in seeing them, just different weird things where people give me permission to post them of hand sticking, people forgetting their name and stuff. And really I think if you watch these, what it, what, the way I like to look at it is if I can make you forget your name, something you've known 
since, you know, you were two, perhaps. So if I can make you forget something you've known all your life, just why could I not have you do something completely different? Now, quickly to touch on mentalism. So why do I, why do I think mentalism is important? Everybody loves magic. Who doesn't like magic? Mm. <laughs> There's always one. Yeah. <laughs> So, so basically, what I, there's two reasons I did this. So, first of all, when I was doing the hypnosis and it wasn't working, you're like, oh shit, I look a right idiot. So, I learned some magic tricks so that what would happen is um, I'd get a card and I'd put it on the table and I'd ask them to put their hands on the table and I'd try and stick their hand to the table. And when it didn't work, they didn't really know I was doing hypnosis and I'd be like, it's really interesting. You've just actually been reading that card through the power of your hand. And then... You know, I'd tell them what a card it was and that sort of thing. So that's really where I got into it, is using it as a get-out. So having this backup plan. But if you think about it, magicians and illusionists, what are they doing? They're manipulating people all the time. They're changing what we perceive. So lots of their skills and the, and the mindset, the way they think, I think in security, especially in social engineering, we can learn a lot from their processes and methodology um, for how we can get people to do things that we you don't want and build these rapports so like cold reading if, I don't know if anyone's a fan of psychics but it's not my thing but they use um, in my mind cold reading so these ambiguous comments that would make sense to somebody and when you tell someone all these inner deep thoughts all of a sudden they want to share all their problems with you and you've built up this rapport and you can influence them and then this comes around again to this sort of mind control process and where you can use all these things using hypnotic language to make it seem like we're reading people's mind. And all these things are to confuse people, to build up rapport with them. And then if you've um, been entertaining someone in the pub all night with these strange magic tricks, if you then see them the next morning, they're like, oh, he's the funny guy from the pub. And trust me, they just walk you on in. Because everyone does magic. So I quickly run out of time, but... The main thing for all of these things is these things don't work the same way for absolutely everybody. We're all different. So we need to understand people's baseline. So some people visually see things or experience things you know, in a visual sense. Some people hear things. I hear dead people and I see dead people. And some people are more emotional. So really, whenever we're trying to manipulate people, we need to understand early on what, how these people work so we can adjust our attack to focus on whether they're more visual or not. So, really important, practice, practice, practice. So, go out in pubs, try these things, research it, try and get permission so you don't get in trouble. So I'm telling you, get permission, what you do, completely up to you. Don't worry about confidence, it doesn't really exist. It's just not about having fear. And the other thing that's really important, big pair of balls, brass balls, because you're going to look stupid, you're going to run into situations where you think, oh, shit, I shouldn't have been here. But really, just keep on pushing forward. These things are difficult, but the more you try, the more you learn. And difficult isn't impossible, so just keep on trying these things, and when they don't work, understand why they didn't work. And some of you might think, yeah, okay, I know all this stuff. Why is it important? Just the fact that you think you know all this stuff makes you more susceptible, because you're just not mindful to what's going on. So you actually can be more suggestible. Now quickly, I think I've got five minutes left. Um, human exploitation is wrong, everyone tells me. You shouldn't be doing these things. So I say, well, I think it's okay to do these things if it's me or someone who's doing it for the right reasons. So ethically, I think it's like anything. A gun can be used to protect someone or it can be used to, to murder someone. I think this information is the same. We can use it to educate people, awareness. Obviously, people can use it for, for bad things as well. So I think as long as your intent is right and the reason you're doing it is for the right reasons, and if you've got any doubts that you don't do it, then you're doing things in an ethical manner. Protection is important. So I real quick say how you can protect yourself. So educate people, learn about these things, empower people to challenge, test these things and practice, and just tell people about your experiences, what things did work, what things didn't work, and make it personal to someone because people react... We were talking about this bit yesterday on the, the podcast that if you make this something personal to someone, then they're going to take it seriously. As it, if it's just all about someone else, we just don't care. And don't become a target. And this is an obvious one, I think, but don't go into the pubs 
and stuff with your work badges on and stuff like that because then you're going to be targeted for these sort of things and be mindful so don't think you know all this stuff and it's rubbish constantly be aware and listening to what people are saying so that you you're less susceptible and less influential so don't stop learning continue to experience these things grow your knowledge because these things are important and uh, you probably can't see this too well I'm going to put this up on the blog after the talk all these people are the, the different authors of books I've read on them so if you're interested in this stuff if you just google some of these authors you'll see all the different books from them so if you're interested you can read a bit more about them so I know we've run out of time I don't think we've got any time for questions two questions any questions no yes no I noticed on the previous uh, slide that you, for body language, had Paul Ekman. Yeah. What do you think of his work? I like it. Um, I think because like he was one of the first guys, obviously, with the micro expression stuff. So I think some people. There's a the guy. This David Matsumoto guy. I think he's not necessarily taken to a different level, but he's doing, I guess, more modern versions of it. Because like Paul stuff is all quite old, and his training material still like people from the 80s and stuff but so I think um, it's still something that doesn't get um, enough credit people really don't focus on micro expressions it's quite difficult because obviously it's happening so quickly so people kind of think well, that's difficult I won't I won't bother with that but no, I think his stuff is good and if you want to like download his training and stuff it's quite cheap and just it's fascinating and you just find the more you just do these things you notice it, it just becomes part of your sort of normal abilities any other questions? Start at the back. Whilst we're waiting for that, so if you have got any more questions, you can get me this email address, and there's um, the two Twitter handles I use, and you can visit the website. So just a quick question, really, and it's more for my interest than anything else. Um, I was just wondering what, if you think these techniques are used anywhere in, in two sort of spheres of uh, activity, training of military personnel, and the other one is sort of religious ceremonies and actually inductions, etc., into okay. these things. My personal opinion is uh, I'm not a religious person. Uh, no disrespect for anyone either way. All these things are our belief system yeah so you believe in something and that's that's why you believe it um, I spoke to some people about um, some hypnosis stuff and things before who are religious and they they believe it's possible and they accept it all but they believe there's another reason why it's working um, so I think it's all about what we believe and making people whether it's me making you believe that I'm going to stick your hand and that becomes your belief system for that moment or there's another power or something doing it like I said, we're all playing our game and the information that we choose to accept becomes our reality. So if that's something that's your interest, um, and I don't want to get into details, but I think people should just challenge why they believe something and then so you make an informed decision. So that's why I said before I was probably a bad person because I didn't believe any of this stuff. It was all load of shit. But then I challenged it and learnt some of it and I think some of it I agree with, some of it I don't, like the NLP stuff. But So you expose yourself to it and make your own judgment so I'm not saying NLP is great or it's rubbish you know with um, military stuff probably like I say this is all just um, all this stuff is not a hypnotist or someone persuading someone isn't really them you know um, you're making those decisions yourself so it's just making you believe that's what you want to do or the best thing well I think uh, I identify very strongly with the focused state of attention yeah. um, and you basically do it automatically, um, especially with foot drill, etc. You just yeah. do it mechanistically yeah. and you respond to the word of command and there's nothing stopping you from yeah. doing it at all. Yeah. Well, like I say, it's this yes set thing, yeah? I've told you to do this, I do it. He told you this, you do it. You kill this person. Yeah, that's what I do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Dale. Thank you. Okay, so small tidbits, uh, we did manage.